It's that time of the week again for the Religious Studies Project podcast. I hope you're sitting comfortably, whether you're in the office, at the gym or at home. My name's David Robertson and I'm here with my co-host... Christopher Carter. And well, I would hope if you're at the gym that you weren't sitting comfortably, you might be on a treadmill or lifting some heavy weights. Well, if you're lifting some heavy weights, I I would think that sitting comfortably is quite important as to avoid, you know, Mm. damage. Some other people who lift heavy weights are the British Association (laughs) for the Study of Religions and the North American Association for the Study of Religions, um, who who both lift them. Heavy theoretical and methodological weights all the time. Indeed. (laughs) (laughs) And they uh, sponsored the uh, Religious Studies Project, and we're very grateful for them. Before any more verbal diarrhea comes out of my uh, mouth, perhaps we're hand over to Tommy Coleman. And this week he's speaking to Claire White on the subject of the cognitive science of reincarnation beliefs. So, Tommy... Thank you for joining us today on the Religious Studies Project. This is Thomas Coleman, and I'm here today with Dr. Claire White. Uh, Dr. White holds the first cognitive science of religion position ever created in the United States in a religious studies department. She is the director of the Cognitive Science of Religion Lab Group at California State Northridge and has been conducting some interesting research on the topic of reincarnation beliefs. Dr. White, welcome to the Religious Studies Project. Thank you for having me. Big fan. (laughs) And uh, a note to our illustrious editors, uh, uh, Dr. White has admitted to using some of the podcasts as helpful resources uh, in teaching. Is that correct? That's exactly. A lot of um, our commuter students love it when they're driving so they can be informed by latest research uh, as they as they drive. That's what we like to hear. I so. uh, was hoping uh, you might start off by discussing your lab and some of the questions motivating your research. Absolutely. So the lab is Cognitive Science of Religion Lab, and it's in the Religious Studies Department in uh, California State University. It has undergraduate students, uh, some graduate students, and some of them are paid research coordinators, and most of them are voluntary. Uh, There's about 12 students in the group, and uh, we meet regularly to uh, conduct research. And they've been very active, actually, in the research that I have conducted. They're also from different disciplines. I make a point of that. So we have Mm -hmm. philosophy students, psychology, anthropology, archaeology, biology, all working together. It's kind of mimics little mini cognitive science of religion agenda, right? (laughs) They get to to feel the frustrations as well as the pleasures of interdisciplinary work from uh, from the get-go. And They've really been active in participating in the research, especially coding a lot of the ethnographic records, which is both frustrating and rewarding. Uh, And in terms of the research questions motivating the research, I guess there's really one primary question that motivates all of the other uh, questions. And it's really, how do we conceptualize reincarnation? This idea that someone can actually be reborn into another physical body and yet somehow retain the same identity so that we can say that person is still Claire or that person is still Tommy. Um, And linked to that is the question of, well, how do we identify them? So if we do believe that Claire or Tommy have uh, undergone death, sometimes an intermediate sphere in the world or another world, and then come back and being reborn as uh, into another physical body, how do we go about identifying who that person is? Uh, who that person has become and uh, how do we find them. And so that's really the, the question about identifying someone through, I think it's fair to say, some of the most dramatic physical changes that are imaginable to a human being. Wow. <laughs> well, uh, you know, to just kind of get us an overview here, uh, you know, the, the first question, uh, what uh, specifically or generally is uh, reincarnation? How many people in the world believe in reincarnation? Is it uh, strictly, you know, limited to certain religions, uh, we might say, or is it, mm. you know, something perhaps creeping up in some more new age traditions and such? Sure. 
Well, I mean, of course, we can define and conceptualize reincarnation in many different ways. And if you look through the ethnographic literature, you probably have a headache within 10 seconds of how broadly it's conceptualized. Um, but some people, researchers across the world, who have actually conducted cross-cultural comparisons, have operationalized it minimally as the idea that someone uh, is reborn into another physical body. Now, I'm primarily interested actually in human-to-human -human reincarnation, which is when you're reborn as another human being. Just taking that conceptualization, that minimal conceptualization, these researchers who have defined it as thus uh, have documented the belief in around 30% of cultures. Now, that's probably an underestimate because... Uh, there are other cultures where it seems to be the case, but it's a little bit ambiguous and that they're excluding them. So they're actually being, uh, that's an underestimate. In terms of how many people believe it, mm -hmm. of course, belief is a really loaded term. Uh, Tony Walterhouse, who is a sociologist, has done some research in the uh, Europe, Europe, and he found that when he asks people how many people believe in it, he only gets around 7%. When he asks uh do you think that the idea itself is plausible? It's more like 25%. Mm. So it's present in uh, major religious traditions. Of course, Buddhism, Hinduism uh, stri uh, strikes immediately to mind. Also, New Age religious movements, spiritual seekers now in the West have ideas about, you know, having past lives. And, uh, of course, it's also uh, influential in a lot of people's lives in the sense that they accept that there's something plausible about the idea, even though they don't necessarily commit to whether or not that, I that idea is true. I guess perhaps they might have a little feeling or a little, of, little bit of an inkling that, uh, you know, perhaps I've been here. Yeah, before. there's a lot of that in uh, my research with uh, spiritual seekers in the United States. I think from a kind of cognitive science of religion perspective, what's even more interesting is not this ontological commitment, but rather just the general um, plausibility that there's something cognitively sticky or intriguing about this idea that you can be reborn or that someone you know can be reborn as someone else. And for me, that's actually more interesting than in even reincarnationist traditions where it's accepted as the norm, part and parcel of society. Uh, how do individuals identify the reincarnated? Let's say I, uh, you know, believe that I perhaps, and perhaps that is a bad word, uh, had, <laughs> had, a, had a prior, had a prior <laughs> life. H how would you, how would you identify me? What, what would be some common kind of folk assumptions or reasoning that you would use in uh, identifying the reincarnated? So, the cross-cultural research that I've conducted looking at things like the human relations area files and there's other quantifications across the world show that actually two types of uh, features are taken as evidence more so than other types of features. Um, one is uh, physical marks, especially marks that are distinctive. Exactly. So you're showing me, is that a tattoo? Or tattoos, yes. Okay, tattoos. So tattoos, for instance, would be just like you would identify a uh, someone who had committed a crime from other similar contenders. They're taken as reliable and they're convenient proxies for recognition. So your tattoos, yes, would be a good candidate. However, I should not have gotten them. I should not however, have. <laughs> I do have to add a caveat that actually congenital traits are more... Uh, common. So there are those that are present from birth because they're less likely to change. And they also indicate this underlying stability. So if you had a mole, perhaps that was mm. present from your birth, I think that would be more reliable. And the second type is memories, actually, but not just any type of memory, episodic memories. So indications that you recognize someone or something, uh, an episode from your previous life, are also privileged across the world as indications that you are, in fact, still Tommy. And what's perhaps special about the episodic memory um, here that, uh, that makes this kind of more relevant than perhaps uh, another type of memory? I think that in addition to 
um, the fact that memories can be reliable. So if you identify someone or something from your previous life, like a physical mark, it can be an indication that you actually were there. But memories seem to have a certain quality about them that, that represents a continuity of self. And Sean Nichols and Klein have done some work on this and has of others. And it's kind of famous in philosophy, read it all. Uh, but the, the general idea is that memories seem to communicate something about ownership. So if I remember a memory, it indicates that I have ownership of that memory, that that memory indicates something about my personality. It's typically emotional as well, and it's oftentimes relational, so it involves someone important to me. And I think together, but especially the sense of ownership over the memory, this constellation of features present in episodic memory are what really makes us believe, here we go with the word believe, makes us accept that if someone remembers something from the past, it really was experienced by that person, and therefore they're one and the same. Uh, and as a professor of cognitive science of religion, mm. what kind of insights does uh, CSR, you know, cognitive science yeah. of religion, bring to bear on uh, reincarnation beliefs? Well, first of all, I think one insight is the actual questions that I approach the research uh, with. So rather than saying, oh, well, all these different types of uh, belief systems are very different in these particularistic societies, which is, of course, really interesting. One question that, that I start with is, well, why on earth are all these, uh, fe- why are how people uh, think about and represent reincarnation similar? So of all the different ways you can identify someone across the world, why are some ways remarkably similar? And this question is one that deserves to be answered and that actually hasn't been addressed to date by uh, scholars. I'm the first person to actually ask this question. Um, and, and if I can interrupt here and, and give you a chance to discuss, I believe you have uh, uh, two papers also, or at least on, on this topic. So yeah. feel free to integrate those and, and, and drop okay. uh, Drop some titles and where uh, you know, the <laughs> listeners may be able to find uh, some of the papers. Sure. So then maybe I'll start with an overview of what the f- there's actually four components to this research are. The first research is experiments with UK undergraduate students um, from mixed religious beliefs. And here I'm asking them to reason uh, in terms of imagining that they have to identify someone who's been reincarnated and asking them and actually manipulating the the types of features uh, in terms of their reliability and in terms of of whether they're physical or psychological, etc. And I was really asking them to imagine that they were someone who actually believes in reincarnation because the ethnographic literature surveys show that these two features are the most common types, right? Physical and also memory. Then the second series of studies is where I actually replicated these experiments with genes in India. So in southern India, I, I did some uh, research there and I replicated the same experiments. Um, sorry, the first study is actually being published in the Journal of Cognition and Culture with the UK participants. The second study with the GNs has been published in Religion, Brain and Behaviour just recently also. The third study is with uh, self-identified spiritual seekers in the United States who believe that they have actually been reincarnated. Wow. And so I conducted this research with philosopher Sean Nichols and also a previous student of mine, Bob Kelly. And we actually interviewed people who thought they'd lived before. And so we asked them to reason how they would identify themselves um, and and looking at their past life that they believed that they had had uh, using sort of similar setup. So how would you know it was you and talk about your past life? And then the fourth uh, I'm sorry, that's going to be published in an edited volume with Helen de Cruz. Very cool. Um, and Sean Nichols um, in Experimental Philosophy and Cognitive Science of Religion. That's forthcoming. And then the fourth is really a, a broad overview of all my research. And it incorporates the ethnographic surveys. And it is appearing in Method and Theory in the Study of Religion. So there's four components, I guess, four things are in the pipeline. So in terms of getting back to cognitive science of religion and how it helps, what, what insights can be brought to bear, you know, we have been kind of championing this idea that religious ideas across the world tend to be similar for certain reasons. Mm-hmm. And the second theory that we have proposed is that our ideas of intentional agents that we interact with as part and parcel of normal cognition, also inform and constrain how we represent and interact with 
uh, agents that are supernatural, so to speak. And so my research suggests strongly, I think, based on all this evidence that I've gathered, that actually ideas about reincarnated agents are informed and constrained by our, our ideas about agents in the world generally. Namely, what we think of as constituting evidence for someone being the same person over time in reincarnation contexts is similar to how we represent someone in, in our day-to-day lives as being the same person. There's nothing extraordinary. And in fact, what's even more interesting is that the concept of reincarnation itself as accepted by everyone I've ever spoken to and as identified in these surveys contradicts how people reason in these experiments. So you asked me right at the start to identify what re- to conceptualize what reincarnation is, right? Uh-huh. And I said it's when you um, accept the idea that someone is reborn into a new physical body. So the former physical body is replaced in this concept. Mm. This is the idea of reincarnation that is accepted around the world. And I've never uh, yet to find a, a, an idea that 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 doesn't accept that that minimal definition. And so this idea is present, but yet in all of these cultures and in the experiments that I run, despite even articulating this idea, Mm. it's a new body, people still implicitly represent physical marks that are similar between the deceased and the living as evidence that they're one and the same person. And they shouldn't do that, we're we're saying, technically speaking. In terms of if you are to be um, faithful to the explicit endorsement of reincarnation, you wouldn't accept that idea. And so this is an example of what has been coined as kind of theologically incorrect and theologically correct reasoning. Um, So that's one finding. And the second is that um, memory seems to be really robust and really important. This kind of aligns neatly with the research in cognitive science of religion, saying that non-physical appearances are what anchors our judgments of people. We seem to represent people as constituted by them. And interestingly, again, another example of where official doctrine or or ideas are not commensurate with how people reason off the cuff is that, you know, Buddhism accepts this idea of a non-permanent self, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there is no such thing as a permanent enduring self, yet when we look at how the even political governance is partially determined uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, of course, they're relying on judgments of the Dalai Lama's Mm -hmm. former um, objects. And that principally implies that a person has continuity of, again, episodic memory, right? That bell is mine. It belongs to me. The child recognizes it because it belonged to them. So again, there's another example, even with the case of memory, where, it goes against the official uh, teachings of the uh, the tradition within which it's embedded. Wow. Um, what other uh, experimental research and findings uh, have you found and, I, I guess, both, uh, conducted uh, uh, to further probe uh, some of these, uh, you know, folk thoughts versus perhaps the intuitive and kind of unconscious fast parts that uh mm. that uh <laughs> you know that you can identify the next Dalai Lama. By. Yeah, these are these are tricky. These are tricky at these these are difficult to design actually. Um I have conducted reasoning experiments. So I get people to reason as though they are uh you know a llama trying to identify the next um the next child who is the Dalai Lama or someone important. Of course, I don't phrase it in any religious tradition because that's if that would be a, a kind of priming effect. I just ask them to imagine you accept reincarnation exists. You are the leader of your village and you have to identify which child is the reincarnation of this person. So then they are given information about the person and four candidates or five candidates and they have to decide. Actually, they rank them in terms of probability or likelihood. Uh, so... I'm not just asking them what they think continues in a person or I'm asking them to rank. So it's a reasoning Mm -hmm. task, which is more likely to get at implicit reasoning than is just asking them outright how likely is somebody to be uh, reincarnated if they have a similar physical feature. So that's how primarily the experiments, the two experiments that I mentioned have been set up. And then I manipulate certain things about the features to see which 
factors are affecting their reasoning, like how distinctive the tattoo or the memory is, right? So are we just empiricists reasoning in terms of how distinctive it is and how likely it is for you to have the same mark as somebody else versus something else? Uh, what are some further directions uh, you plan to take your research, Some perhaps some uh, experiments already underway, some things you're thinking about doing in the future? So I think I've kind of exhausted for my research agenda mm-hmm. uh, the question of, you know, what makes people around the world believe that someone is the same person? And what I, okay, I guess I should have said is that this question isn't really a kind of a parochial question or a particularistic question from this uh, ethnocentric point of view that we find it exotic. Mm-hmm. Actually, it um, motivates many behaviors around the world in kinship systems and uh, even wealth and inheritance and political governance are determined by identifying the person. So I think it is a really important question that deserves further attention, especially from researchers who are specialists in certain areas of the world to see how culture informs cognition and vice versa. But I, for now, I'm kind of hanging up my hat on that question. One further research question that my lab have been uh, starting to work with is more to do with uh, these past life groups in Southern California, especially where they're prominent. So these reincarnationist traditions, you know, these new age spiritual seekers that seem to be attracted to them. I mean, it waxes and wanes, so it's not fair for me to say they've become increasingly popular. That would Mm be uh, not accurate, but they are at a peak right now. So one question that I have is why are people becoming increasingly attracted to these uh, past life groups? What do they seem to offer uh, a specific demographic if they do offer a specific demographic, which Mm -hmm. all the research suggests it is kind of, um, you know, Western white, uh, people who have maybe a bit, a bit more of, um, uh, income Mm -hmm. than others and, you know, disposable income, sorry, than others. So what is it about these and how have these groups changed or modified ideas about reincarnation? So I've been participating in some of the groups around Southern California, and we've been analyzing some of the data from Meetup. Please share. See. Yeah, please share. <laughs> you want to share the the preliminary stuff? Well, yeah, fun? if you have any. Yeah, anything yeah we have preliminary have, stuff. Have two, three more minutes left. Yeah. Uh, so the Meetup group suggests that these uh, groups are very eclectic, and it's not just past lives. People here seem to be very open to all different types. So Ricky, healing, etc. Not quite surprising. One thing that I find from the past life groups that is really interesting is that people actually it's framed very much in terms of trauma and growing self in actualization as an individual person so when you attend these groups there's a certain psychological healing that takes place Mm. where you relive or reenact or you're confronted with typically a traumatic negative experience that happened to you and then you're sent off to kind of think about this trauma and to kind of psychologically heal yourself so it's very much psychotherapeutic framework sounds, sounds like a big episodic <laughs> memory uh, exactly terms, i can you know, this tragic yeah. event whatever yeah whatever they i can hear harvey whitehouse actually in my ear who used to be my supervisor <laughs> saying modes of religiosity modes of religiosity which of course is another theory that we don't have time to get into but these groups are becoming increasingly popular and i think it's interesting because here they seem to be very different to reincarnationist traditions where of course the idea is to escape the cycle of rebirth no one wants to be reincarnated it's a negative thing um and there's no such talk of self-actualization uh in in the same context it's not psychotherapeutic there is no trauma that's typically associated with reincarnation so i think the modern west has revamped and sexed up reincarnation in a way that meets the kind this kind of really popular western notion especially in individualistic cultures where the, you know we're here to fulfill our potential as human beings and resolve all these uh, traumatic experiences and it's also very profitable um for certain clinical practitioners not necessarily the past life groups where it's more community based well uh, i certainly suppose that that is something we've come to expect from the <laughs> West, uh, you know, definitely sex up anything like that. <laughs> exactly. Reincarnation. But uh, 
Uh, well, I think that route wraps us up okay. for this episode. But uh, if uh, you could perhaps tell the listeners where they can go to find out more about your research, sure. uh, your work, maybe you have a website or academia. Yeah. Sure, I do. I have uh, my all my papers are listed on my academia page. My website uh, is listed on the academia page, um, and I also have uh, the papers are all forth are are just um, either just been published or they're on the cusp of being published. Cool. The website is uh, clairejwhite.wix.com forward slash Claire New all one word. Cool. And uh, I mentioned at the beginning where they can find the journal articles. So watch out because they're all coming out at once. (laughs) Well, uh, Dr. Claire White, thank you very much for uh, joining us on the Religious Studies Project. Thanks so much, Tommy. Thank you, Tommy and Claire. And it's good to hear uh, that's Tommy's first interview this year. He's always uh, one of our regular uh, interviewers and one of our our best and uh, brings a psychological, cognitive um, approach that we you know, is otherwise underrepresented. So Absolutely. thanks to Tommy as always. So um, we always like to have a, an announcement for you at the end of every podcast. And uh, this week, uh, we're going to tell you about Alad Thomas. Um, he's a, a wonderful chap at the uh, Open University in the United Kingdom, studying, um, amongst other things, Scientology. Um and he is stepping up to the plate um, to join our editorial team um, yeah. on a sort of we're an interim basis, but um, you know, we've been he's been on the periphery for a while. Indeed, um, yeah. Um, Venetia needed to take a break uh, for a few months to get her thesis under control, um, and so we invited Alad to step in in the meantime. Um, and he's doing a sterling job so far. Yeah, managing our social media feeds. Just I don't think we mentioned that a few months that's, ago. Yeah, yet. that's right. Um, so yeah, if you're communicating with us via social media, it's very likely that it is Alid who you'll be speaking to. So I hope you will extend him a, a warm RSP welcome. And although Venetia's uh, shoes will be difficult to step into because uh, she did such a great job last year, one of the nice things about the social media role is that everybody who does it brings their own flavour to it and we get to see a slightly different approach and a different take, which is always nice. Absolutely. So, welcome, Alid. Um, next week's podcast is another one from uh, Brad Stoddard. So, last week you heard Brad Stoddard speaking with uh, Russell McCutcheon and Aaron Hughes. Uh, next week he's going to be speaking with Eric Mazur on religion and American law, which should be very interesting. Um, interesting to get the sort of US inflected focus there. Mm, Building maybe on the um, Susan Palmer interview Mm -hmm. that we had last year, which uh, focused, there was a little bit about the US, but it focused much more on the European situation and also focused on new religions, whereas this is going to be talking more about the um, quote unquote world religions. Absolutely. As ever, remember our Facebook page and Twitter page. Um, Alud will be delighted uh, to see you there. Nice. Yeah, yeah, see what I did. And um, remember iTunes or whatever other portals you get the podcast through to, you know, rate us. Um, that'll bump us up the rankings. Um, and just, you know, keep telling your, your friends, family, colleagues, everyone about this wonderful podcast that you listen to. And finally, our Amazon links, .co.uk.com and .ca. Don't forget about them when buying all of your pot plants and academic texts and little miniature hobbit figures and things like that. And as always, thanks for listening. Boom. Boom.